Hi folks, and welcome back to Intro to Performance Studies. I'm excited to talk to you today about performance and performance studies and how the two interact. Today is our first sort of introductory lecture on what is performance? How are we supposed to understand what this particular area of study is? And how are we supposed to understand its relationship to the act of performing in theater, in performing poetry, in performing music? What is the relationship between performance and performance? And studies and why do we consider them an academic discipline? Those are the main questions we're going to field today. I want to get started though, like I indicated in the syllabus last time, by doing a little bit of a breathing exercise and then also showing you some very minor stretches that you can do to your level of comfort at home as a way of centering our bodies before we begin. Because as we'll talk about today, performance studies is really invested in the idea that our bodies act as sites of experience and knowledge, that they're places in which through our own actions and also through our interactions with others, we come to understand things and feel things and know things and learn things. So what performance studies oftentimes will say is that in other academic disciplines and also in other parts of the world, the body gets really de-emphasized, that we focus on language, what we speak, and we focus on what we think, but we don't so much focus on what we feel, and what we can't put into words is oftentimes uh, bracketed as sort of illegitimate or something that doesn't make sense. So the things that we just feel in our body oftentimes are dismissed as forms of experience or forms of knowledge, and that's something that performance studies wants to push back on really hard. So in our discussions, we'll see a lot of ways that performance studies talk Talks about the real act of performing is doing that, but in keeping with this idea that we want to emphasize the body as a site of knowledge, that we want to think about how our bodies feel, think, and know things, we want to start out our days by getting in touch with our bodies a little bit, by making sure we're taking a moment to attend to where our bodies are at, to think about how we're feeling, to think about what uh, we've been feeling over the course of the day, and to try to relax and center ourselves. So <clears throat> I just want to give a couple of brief examples of things you can do here at the beginning of class periods, and I'll maybe lead you in some ex other exercises at different times, but this is like a general go-to thing. If I don't give you a specific instructions or tell you to do this at the beginning of class, this is sort of what I'm going to be talking about, okay? It's like one is breathing. So I want to talk about two different types of breathing you could do at the beginning of class if you want to. So one is called box breathing. Oftentimes in yoga you might be familiar with it. I'm not a big practicing yogi and as you'll see in a second when we do stretches I'm not at all a flexible person. So all of this is about experimenting. Never push your body beyond its own comfort level, always be checking in and feeling how you're doing. So if you can't do anything we're doing, that's totally fine. Um, and I might honestly fall over while I'm trying to demonstrate some stretches in a second. So don't worry about it if it's a problem for you. But try to take this moment to focus on how your body feels and really get into a moment of trying to feel centered if you can. So breathing. I want to talk about box breathing, which is when you there are sort of two variations on box breathing that you can do, that both of which I find very calming and very centering. So the first one is that you can pick a number. So let's say five. And so if you've picked the number five, you're going to inhale for five breaths, hold it for five breaths, and then exhale for five breaths. So one, two, three, four, five, and then you'll hold it for five beats and then you'll exhale for five beats, and then you'll hold the empty breath for five beats. So it would be something like... And you would just keep repeating that process over and over and over again. So perhaps if you're at home, you can do it with me now. So uh, we'll breathe in. One, two, three, four, five. We'll hold it. Exhale. <sighs> 
hold it for five. Inhale for five. Okay, I let go a little bit early there, but you understand the point is that in the way the, the reason you call that box breathing is that it's square, right? So you are going in for five breaths, holding for five breaths, releasing for five breaths, and holding that empty breath for five breaths. And you're thinking about, or for five beats, and you're thinking about that whole time, you're feeling the breath in your lungs, you're feeling your lungs expand to hold that air, you're feeling how it feels to be breathless or full of breath, you're noticing and experiencing your body. So the other thing that you can do breathing wise in this way is to start small and then build up and then build back down. So it, for example, you could go from one to five. So you could inhale for a breath, hold it for a breath, exhale for a beat, hold it for a beat, inhale for two beats, Inhale for three beats. Exhale for three beats. And so on until five. And then you would work back down to one. So take a minute now, maybe pause it before the next like the rest of the lecture begins, um, or before we move into the stretching part of our introduction, and try doing both of them. Try doing one set of box breathing where for, let's say, 10 breaths, you hold to five and then exhale, uh, and then try doing one round of box breathing from one until five and from five back down to one. And both of those, I think, are both really relaxing breathing exercises in ways that are really helpful for getting you thinking about and feeling like you are located in your body. All right, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about is just a little bit of easy stretching for you to start our class lectures with. Uh, so I am not, as I said, a yoga expert or a stretching expert or even really very flexible. So everything that I'm recommending do to your comfort level. If you can't do it, that is okay. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, I can provide some alternative recommendations or you can further your breathing or choose another meditation. Or if you are a more advanced yoga sort of person, please uh, feel free to substitute this with a flow that you find more uh, suitable to your own skill set or skill level. And always feel free if you have recommendations for stretches or warm ups to send to me an email. Email. But in any case, uh, just what I like to do at the beginning of class is just a very easy little circle um, of stretches. So, so to start out by going up as far as you can, and then going down to your toes. I cannot touch my toes. You don't have to either. Just get as close as you can. Feel the burn in your uh, hamstrings, if you, if you have a burn in your hamstrings like I do. And then slowly, slowly, slowly rise up. Feel all of your vertebrae align. Feel your body straighten out. Get your neck all straight. And then do some shoulder rotations back and forth. Feel that. And then we're going to go to the arms next. So we're going to pull one arm this way and look in the direction. So I'm stretching to my left right now. You're looking in the direction of the arm that's extended. Your right hand is pulling your left arm. Um, and you feel all of the muscles in your back start to sort of unclench a little bit. You should feel your shoulder blades open up a little bit. And then you move to the other side and do the same thing. And then the next part, which is the most balance intensive of this, is to come up on one foot. So I'm grabbing my right foot and balancing on my left foot. And we're working on that sense of balance. If you can't do this again, that is totally OK. Um, but we'll stand on our left foot for a minute. Um, and then not for one minute, but for maybe 
15 seconds, you're going to pull your right foot as far back as you can um, into your back area slash your butt. Um, and then you're going to grow up and you're going to take up the other one instead. Um, so now I'm holding my left hand and I'm pulling that, um, or my left foot, and I'm pulling that back as far as I can. And I'm feeling my balance. And then we're going to just go up and down one more time. And then slowly, slowly feeling your whole body while you come back up, get into a straight line again. And then take a couple of deep breaths. And that's our preliminary stretching exercise. So that's how I want us to think about opening class every day then, is to do something breathing related and something stretching related. Oftentimes also what we would do in a normal class period is have uh, a interactive activity that we would do together, something like zip, zap, zop, if you've ever played that in theater or something like that, where we are interacting with one another. Obviously that doesn't really work here, but I am gonna find some vocal warm-ups and post them and we'll work through those a little bit as we move on as well just to get ourselves talking and used to performing at the beginning of class in addition to trying to center our bodies. So, but that's going to conclude our bit about stretching. Uh, so I'm going to transition now to a more uh, ordinary sort of lecture format. So I'm going to pause here um, and I'll catch up with you in just one second. All right, folks, welcome back. Uh, so let's start our discussion then of Sechner. As I indicated uh, earlier, the lecture notes for um, all of our discussions of the readings are located on Sakai under uh, resources and then class notes. So uh, please feel free to use these to follow along and as uh, sort of skeletons for your own lecture notes if you'd like to. I do want to say though that these lectures are not intended to be comprehensive overviews of the reading um, going through every little bullet point. Um, obviously would be um, a very lengthy process in most circumstances and would probably overwhelm us with detail. So my objective here has been both to assign you readings that are manageable in length and is to compile lectures that hit the highlights of those readings and help you think through them critically and think about how you might apply them to the world of performance. Um, as far as uh, the content in the chapters goes, most of your exams are going to ask you to draw on concepts from the reading in application. That is, both of your exams um, are uh, dedicated, the first is dedicated to analyzing one of your peers' performances, and the second is dedicated to writing about your own final performance. So all of the material you learned this semester, I'm never going to be like, hey, tell me what Boal said on the first day of class, what is the second, like, what does play mean? Um, but you will be expected to know and be conversant in all of these concepts. So all of that being said, I'm just trying to emphasize that I expect you to do the readings thoroughly. And if there are things in the readings that you find interesting that I don't talk about, um, or that you have further questions that I don't address in lectures, please feel free to write about those things in your forums post, um, or to ask those things in FAQs, and I'll make sure that I cover everything that you have questions or inquiries about. Um, but I am going to try to distill some of the reading that we're doing down into uh, <clears throat> its main components as opposed to going over every single little detail in lecture. And I think that that'll work better for all of us. So that being said, the notes that I post or the lecture notes that I post are meant as a guide. Do not think that everything that is in the chapter is in the notes. I do expect you to be doing the reading on your own and taking your own independent reading notes in addition to listening to the lectures. So you probably knew that already, um, but it just is worth repeating that it's important for us to be uh, doing the reading before the lectures or even if you need to catch up after the lectures, but to make sure that uh, you're keeping up with the reading in addition to listening to, to the lectures and reading the lecture notes that I provide. Okay. So all of that being said then, let's get into the Sessioner reading 
lecture raises the questions, what is performance and what is performance studies? And those are the primary questions that we're going to be asking both today and through the course of the semester. Because as the session chapter emphasizes, there aren't really easy answers to either of the questions. What is performance is an especially vague question, and how one decides what performance studies is or how one ought to practice performance studies depends a lot on how you conceptualize what performance is in the first place. So these are not settled questions. Performance studies as a field, of course, has an idea of what it is and what it does. It studies critically performance and its social and political significance. But in that framework, there is a lot of rich ambiguity and contradiction that we'll be exploring all semester. So these are big questions that are going to stay with us. And Setcher wants to point out throughout this chapter that the question of what is performance is exceedingly complicated, and is also a question that is fundamentally culturally situated. And by that, he means, and I mean, that what we consider to be a performance, how we evaluate or appreciate or understand and interpret performances, and how we go about performing, all of those things depend a lot on both the cultures in which those performances take place, and also the politics or the power differentials within that culture that define how performance is conducted and what counts as as and what does not count as art or high quality performance. So these are all questions that he wants to consider, or complexities that Sessioner wants to consider in his investigations. So to begin then, he stresses that to perform means a variety of things in different contexts. That we perform in everyday life all the time. So for instance, uh, your assignment for this week that's due on Friday is to pick a moment in your life in which you were performing. And as we said, this could be a moment in which you were actually performing in a play or something, but could also be a moment in which you were performing uh, a role for a parent. So performing the role of the golden child or a moment in which you were performing to impress your friends. And those kinds of things are everyday life sorts of performances. How you perform in social situations, how you perform in business contexts, how you perform in uh, the academy, when you're talking to other people at school, when you're talking to professors at school, how those sorts of things involve us performing every day. So that's what we want to understand is everyday sorts of performances, those things that come out of our everyday lives. Artistic performances are things that are usually more uh, rigidly defined or formally defined or have a more established tradition behind them. So for instance, music has an established um, and varied tradition behind it. So does the theater and poetry. All of these things are artistic Forms. Um, and when we talk about uh, performance, oftentimes what we mean is the performing arts. We mean performing art. But again, as Sechner is going to emphasize, what is considered art in a given context is oftentimes subject to debate. And so the distinction between uh, what we consider to be artistic performance and other sorts of performance is going to be something that we're going to be asking questions about or interrogating over the course of the semester. And another example he gives in which performance means something different is the athletic context, in which we talk about athletes as performing, as uh, people as performing highly or to the best of their abilities or exceeding uh, the standards that we usually have for athletic performance. And in all of those circumstances, we're talking about something that's a little bit different than when we perform in everyday life um, or a little bit different than when we perform on stage but at the same time is similar. And so the question is, what makes all of these things performance? How are these things related to each other? And what does it mean to understand them as performances? So Sessioner starts us off by providing us a number of categories through which we can understand performance. The first category that he gives us is what he calls being. The second is doing. The third is he calls showing doing. And the fourth is explaining showing. So 
just to break this down a little bit, because the vocabulary is a tiny bit clunky, when he talks about being, he's talking about existence. He's talking about how things exist in the world, in their natural or in a natural state. And this, honestly, might be a little bit of a counterintuitive way to think about performance, because I think, and ultimately he will argue, when we think about performing, we think about oftentimes uh, reciting a script or rehearsing something that has come before, playing a piece of music. You perform X, you perform a thing or a role. So the idea here is that uh, being or as existence isn't something we might typically consider as performance. But on the other hand, we do think about uh, performances as something that exist or have a sort of being in the world. And we think about when we perform, we think about it that as being in a sort of state of being or a state of existence. So it is a mode of being to perform. And what does that mean? That means that, for instance, when you step into the shoes of Macbeth, when you're playing Macbeth, what you're doing is inhabiting a mode of being. So we can think about it in this way, as you are existing or acting in a certain way that gives performance its own sort of being. At the same time, what we think about in terms of that being is oftentimes doing, which is the performance of action. Um, the performance of action. So when we think about <clears throat> doing, we just want to think about how we act in the world. And again, this isn't necessarily rehearsing um, a play or acting in a theatrical context. Every day, you perform little actions that have value that goes above and beyond what they simply do on a transactional level. So when you tip your waiter, right? That is a communicative and a performative dimension that goes above and beyond anything that that is just involved in the act of handing over bills. So little things that we do every day have this sort of performative dimension. And as we'll talk about later, a lot of our everyday activities are often conditioned by politics, um, racial politics, gender politics, class politics, in ways that so our actions reflect something about the world, perform something about the world, even in ways that aren't necessarily conscious to us. So doing things is always performance in this kind of capacity. The third way is showing doing. And this is where you want to think about more the representations of uh, action that you see in theater or in television or other forms of popular culture, where to perform means that you are acting out something that is elsewhere. So I, every, when on Friday, all of you will perform, you will show doing by performing a narrative about something else. And when we are in plays, we show doing by performing narratives. So, so those are examples in which uh, the performance itself is not only the expression, the performance is meant to represent or communicate something outside of it. And this happens all the time, especially in artistic activity. Uh, and then the last category is explaining, showing, doing. Um, and again, I know that this uh, sort of terminology is a little clunky, but the idea here is that uh, in terms of uh, showing doing, being a communication to the audience, explaining showing doing would be a writing, would be the object of performance studies, an effort to comprehend the world of performance and the world as performance. That is, it would be a way of analyzing or dissecting what is going on in the performance to show what it communicates, to explain how it communicates. And that is going to be one of the main ways we want to conceptualize performance studies. So let me put it in a little bit uh, slower and simpler terms quickly. So remember, showing doing is representing or communicating about action. So it's the way in which, for instance, a play can be 
about something. It can be an allegory about power. It can be a satire about the political situation. It can communicate something about something outside of itself. So performance can be about things. People perform about race. People perform about gender. People perform about class. People perform about politics. All of that is showing doing because it represents and communicates. Meaning showing doing, then, is the work of unpacking how that communication happens through performance. So the object of performance studies, then, is to explain how the act of performing goes about constructing or communicating or influencing uh, our social relationships, our culture, the political relationships or the power relationships that define that culture, how performance can be a vehicle both for enforcing the power relationships of our culture, and also how it can be a vehicle for uh, seeking to work beyond or see beyond or uh, oppose those power structures that define our culture. So performance is all about social, cultural, and political processes. It's all about power, and it's 100% focused on the idea that the act of performing, that what is so special about performing is the way that it goes about defining our worlds and defining our lived reality. And we're going to get into that a little bit more, especially when we talk about conquer good as we proceed. But so that's the idea of explaining, showing, doing. And so we have this range of understandings of performance then from something simply existing or from performance as being a mode of existence to performance as action to performance as representative action or action that demonstrates or communicates something else and then performance as a reflection on performance and its power. So that last category, again, is what performance studies really is. It's how does performance work? How is it related to the construction of cultural, social, and political meanings? And as Sechner says, usually uh, the object of performance studies is taken up by performance studies scholars. That is the effort to understand the world of performance and the world as performance. Both of those things are things that usually performance studies scholars do. But oftentimes, um, or in other cases, performances can also be reflexive. So this word reflexive is something that's going to be important for all of our discussions in the future, and it's something that uh, Sechner uses a lot in this chapter. The idea behind being reflexive with an X or being uh, or what we'll oftentimes call reflexivity is to is to be internally reflective is to look back on yourself and understand yourself. So if we talk about performance studies as a reflexive effort to understand the world of performance, what we're talking about is how performance is interested in looking in on how it works, in understanding or reflecting on how it functions, how it produces meaning, as we have said. So to be reflexive as a performance studies scholar is first to say that we are looking internally to say, how does the communication process of performance works? And that's one of the reasons this is housed in the communication studies department, is how are these meetings produced? How are social meetings performed in everyday life? What are the consequences or significance of the performances that make up our lives? So that is one of the ways that Session is going to emphasize reflexivity. Another way that we often talk about the importance of scholars being reflexive is considering your own social position um, or your own cultural position um, when you are considering your relationship to knowledge. Um, so in other words, as a person who is a white male, um, I have a particular social position that I have to keep in mind as limiting my perspective. Um, so in the circumstances that Sechner is going to apply the term, he's oftentimes going to talk about how performance scholars um, need to think about how their own classifications of what counts as performance or what counts as art are culturally contingent and that their understanding 
understandings of what constitutes performance is something that can only really be qualified from the perspective in which they're making that judgment. So reflexivity is going to be a really important part of conducting performance studies because what is going to happen in a lot of performance studies is that I am going to study a performance of somebody from a different culture. So I need to be reflexive about how it is that my position constructs the uh, interpretation I give of that performance. So something that is really, really important about performance studies then is that in many ways it looks at the act of criticism or the act of doing academic work as another kind of performance. So I have to think about the way that my analysis of the performance performs its own sort of action. And I have to think critically about how my position as the performer might influence what kind of action it takes. The final way in which he talks about reflexivity here is to say that oftentimes performances themselves can often be also be reflexive. So a lot of times you might think about this also in terms of the uh, idea of being meta. Uh, so the idea that, for instance, you would be self-conscious or critical about things in the performance as they take place. So this might be, for instance, that you are intentionally riffing on some sort of sexist theme in film in order to illustrate that it is in fact sexist. In those sorts of circumstances, what you're doing is being reflexive, is you're thinking about how film, for instance, has a history of sexism, and you're taking that perspective and using it to perform your own work. In a more dated example, he talks about the playwright Bertolt Brecht, who's a famous German playwright, and he innovated this concept of breaking the fourth wall, which is very common now. This idea that there's a moment in which a character will stand outside of the action of the drama and reflect on it. The actor will, or where the actor will turn and acknowledge the audience as the audience and enjoin them to participate in the drama. These are moments in which we break the fourth wall because you're taking what is ordinarily presented as something separate from you, the play, something that is communicating action, and you in reveal that it is in fact a performance. So you reveal or talk about the fact that it is a play or a performance. So there are many famous examples of this sort of breaking of the fourth wall. One of my favorites comes from a uh, sort of little known horror art film called Funny Games that I would highly recommend to those of you who um, are not faint of heart. Uh, where uh, the uh, sort of antagonists in the film um, who are tormenting this family uh, have the ability to interact with the camera and indeed manipulate the film at the climax of the movie. So they reveal the fact that you are indeed watching a film, but in a way that is very... Uh, meta, right? That it comments on the fact that it is a film at the same time as it is a film. And that is what we would call reflexive. It is the self-consciousness about the fact we are performing. And the reason why that self-consciousness is so important is not just because it is like a fun gimmick, although sometimes it is, but it allows us to critically explore what the medium of performance that we're engaging is, what its history is, and how it may have its own problematics and biases. This is what Sechner is going to this is what Sechner is going to talk about under the label of the restoration of behavior or restored behavior, which we're going to get to in just a second. But before we do, we should talk through the eight kinds of performance that Sechner talks about, and this will help us expand our discussion of the way in which performance is complicated and refers to a lot of things that are different, but at the same time seem to be united by something. So the eight different categories that he gives, and we'll only go into detail on a few of them, are everyday life, the arts, sports and popular entertainment. So we've already talked about those three. Then 
business. We've talked about that a little bit in the side as well um, as being a space in which we perform certain roles, in which we perform to impress colleagues, in which we perform the role of the boss, where we perform the role of the subordinate worker. We perform the role of the pizza delivery driver. In all of these circumstances, we are once again performing. And so business and everyday life intersect in a lot of ways, but business is also an environment that has rigid conventions in a lot of circumstances. So we think about that as a context in which we perform as well. So we've got everyday life, the arts, sports, popular entertainment, and business. And then the fifth is technology. Um, so we perform both on or through technology or using technology. Um, and we also think about technology as something that performs certain social roles all the time. So the Zoom application that I am using right now is performing a role that allows me to communicate with you. And otherwise, I would be unable to in this similar context. Or, I mean, you know, YouTube and iMovie, but Zoom in other contexts. So both of those are technologies that perform a communicative role. And so we want to think about how technologies work as performers and as things that enable performance or as vehicles for performance. Uh, the next category he gives is sex. Um, and in this case, we should think about sexuality and sexual identity, as well as the physical act of sex, which Sessioner talks about here. The idea being that in all of these circumstances, we are performing. We are performing either our gender, um, as we'll talk about in a lot of detail later in the semester when we talk about Judith Butler, or we're performing what we think constitutes desirable sexually attractive activity. Um, we perform sex in relationship to the media all the time. Sechner argues that our uh, understandings of what constitutes sexiness and what we ought to do in sexual relationships a lot of times are taken from scripts uh, that we see in films and television. And this is to a point he wants to argue as well, is that the boundaries between a lot of these different kinds of performances are really ambiguous because in terms of sex, he argues, there's a definite relationship between the performance of sex and uh, the arts because the arts provide a model of the way that we think about sexuality and sexual attractiveness. So he talks about then there being a relationship between these kinds of performances or fuzzy boundaries between certain of these performance types. The next one is ritual, which is sacred or secular. So you can think about ritual performances as being, for instance, a baptism is a sacred ritual in the Christian tradition when one is absolved of original sin by being dipped in water, typically holy water. Um, <clears throat> secular rituals might be things like voting or things like saying the Pledge of Allegiance in high school. These are moments in which we collectively enact a behavior according to certain scripts or traditions. And then finally, play, uh, being the type of imaginative activity and interaction you engage with when you're children, um, and also still as adults oftentimes. So things that we do that don't have a definite script, but still have certainly socially negotiated rules. So tag has a set of rules, that's a form of play, but your movements are largely unrestricted. When we think about play, we're oftentimes thinking about something less regimented, um, but it still draws from social scripts. And so this is really important because we're getting to the idea here of performance as restored um, behavior, <clears throat> which is to say that all of these different forms of ritual that we've just talked about draw from scripts, whether they're explicit theatrical scripts or explicit movie scripts, or they're socially negotiated norms. So in the section that um, on restored behavior or on performance as restored behavior that uh, we're discussing in session right now, I've drawn a few uh, quotes and put these in the Google document so you can review them as I read them um, that really get to the crux of this idea. So to start then, Sessioner writes, the habits, and this is on page 28 in the reading also that is cited in your document. So he writes, the habits, rituals, and routines of life are restored behaviors. 
Restored Behavior is living behavior treated as a film director treats a strip of film. These strips of behavior can be rearranged or reconstructed. They are independent of the causal systems, personal, social, political, technological, etc., that brought them into existence. They have a life of their own. The original truth or source of the behavior may or may not be known, or may be lost, ignored, or contradicted, even while that truth or source is being honored. How the strips of behavior were made, found, or developed may be unknown or concealed, elaborated, distorted by myth or tradition, Restored behavior can be of long duration as in ritual performances or of short duration as in a fleeting gesture such as waving goodbye. So that is a, a very sort of poetic and beautifully written paragraph, honestly, especially for something that is drawn from an introductory textbook. Uh, but B, I think, really gets to the point that Sessioner is trying to make here, which is what unites everything from sports to everyday interactions to business to sex is that they all draw on things. They cite things that have come before them, that we perform when we perform, we step into these social scripts that exist before us. And as we said, sometimes these are literal scripts. Sometimes the performance is uh, taking a script and cutting it up and rearranging it and performing the new result. And you'll do something like that later on in the semester. Uh, but oftentimes the scripts are things inc that are incredibly mundane in everyday life. You wake up and you brush your teeth every day according to a script. And these scripts that we follow have a lot of important social consequences and condition us to behave in certain ways. And that is how we're going to be discussing the political impact of performance all semesters in terms of the way in which performing in many cases draws on conventions and that those conventions have real and definite political consequences. So uh, moving a little bit further into the discussion, this is something that uh, Sessioner emphasizes, is that restored behavior, what uh, characterizes restored behavior most of all, is that it exists outside of me. It is something that I do not invent or originate. It is something that I have learned. So he talks about how what distinguishes many times performance in everyday life from uh, staged performance or musical performances, etc., is that performances sometimes mark or make explicit the fact that they are of this restored nature. They mark or make explicit the fact that they are of this restored nature. So what does that mean? That means, in, for instance, in the example of a play, uh, we will advertise the fact that the play is written by a particular person, directed by a particular person. People will stage Shakespeare over and over and over again. There is an understanding, a marking, or making explicit then, that that gesture is restored, that it comes from somewhere. If you if you think, for instance, about the wedding tradition or the traditional Christian wedding tradition, that is very much marked as restored. There is a highly regimented set of movements that are passed down from generation to generation that appear in virtually every wedding. The exchange of the wedding bands, the walking of the bride down the aisle with her father or father figure, um, those sorts of uh things are very highly conventionalized. And you can think about how uh, the way in which marriage was figured as a stylized tradition in which these things always happened was used as an argument against gay marriage at first. So we can think in those circumstances about how traditions, A, identify themselves as such, or performances of traditions oftentimes do identify themselves as such, and B, how these things have definite politics even when they explicitly identify themselves as performances. 
Even given that, though, what we really want to emphasize here is that in some circumstances, performances mark their restored nature explicitly. So they mark the fact that they are cultural traditions. They mark the fact that they are recapitulations of things that have come before them. So to give a final example, you might think of a remix or a mashup. Both of those types of musical performances take something that has come before them and recycle it or recombine it into a new product. And as a result, um, they make something that uh, is at least in many ways new, but they explicitly mark their relationship to a tradition as well. So that's what we want to think about in terms of the idea of restored behaviors, that it's related to a tradition. But there's something that is even more important here, which is that not all performance marks the fact that it is restored or related to a tradition. So the brush your teeth tradition every morning, for instance, is a good example because that is something you should just do, right? It is a uh, natural and hygienic thing as far as I know that is not a controversial statement, um, but it is something that is culturally established and we do not think about that as being a tradition or as it being a performance. We think about that as just being a part of everyday life. And a lot of things are naturalized as not performances when in fact they are. So for instance, when we get to Judith Butler later on in the summer session, we'll talk about how uh, the way that we perform gender in everyday life has been configured as something, has been produced culturally as something that is natural, when in fact it is a hundred percent an artificial con uh, performance um, that is based on uh, what she calls gender scripts. So we have again this idea of scripting, that we're reciting something that came before us. So this is the main way then that Suchner wants to define performance and as such define what performance studies is. He wants to say that performance studies is the study of restored behavior, that performance is engaging in restored behavior. Now, it's important to note that that's not to say that restored behavior is just doing things over and over again and repeating what has come in the past. He talks about how we can recombine and remix and cut and paste social scripts, elements of culture together to produce new things, how we can use elements of social scripts that may have one point be may at one point have been oppressive or may be oppressive actively and subvert them or not honor their original sources and use them to different ends. So he's not saying there is like no free will, although most social scientists aren't going to make a strong argument for there being a free will. He's not saying that everything we do is just a repetition of the same. But what he is saying is that whenever we are uh, performing in our lives, what we are doing is drawing on these scripts that are outside of ourselves, and that we might stumble upon or innovate new meanings in that process, but that in order to act, and in order to be known, and in order to communicate with others, we always have to be drawing on scripts that are communally uh, understandable, that everybody can understand when we recite them. So we have to be referring backward to things in order to make them make sense in a new form. And this is what Sechner is saying at the uh, end of the passage, or on this, at the end of this section, where he says, quote, restored behavior is symbolic and reflexive. Its meanings need to be decoded by those in the know. This is not a question of high versus low culture. A sports fan knows the rules and strategies of the game, the statistics of key players, the standings, and many other historical and technical details. Ditto for the fans of the rock band. So the idea here then is that when we think about performance as restored behavior, we want to think about how when we engage in performing, we are either drawing on literal rules, conventions, and scripts like those that uh, define sporting events, that define theater practices, that define musical performances, or we are drawing on social scripts um, or political scripts that dictate how we behave in everyday life, or cultural scripts that uh, dictate how we behave in everyday life. 
So what's really important then about restored behavior is on the one hand, it defines what performance is. Performance is restored behavior because when we perform, we draw on these scripts that exist outside of ourselves. On the other hand, to understand performance then, one has to be familiar with or understand the scripts that lead to its production. So, uh, in order to understand football, you have to understand the rules of football. In order to understand Shakespeare, you have to have some sense of the Shakespearean tradition and what Shakespearean language means. In order to know and understand the content of the performance, you have to be familiar with its rules. And on the surface, that's a really, I think, uh, intuitive observation that if I were to watch, for instance, like rugby or curling, I wouldn't be able to follow it. I wouldn't be able to know what what's going on. But that's going to be incredibly important in performance studies because, for instance, when we want to study the traditional performances of a culture that is different than our own, we then get into the question of how we are to understand their social scripts. And that is an incredibly difficult thing for somebody outside of another culture to do, for us to decode what they mean. So that is going to be really, really important as well that because performance has this relationship to history, to culture, this looking backward where we have are always reciting things that have come before us, to understand and to evaluate performance requires understanding the cultural context in which it is produced, the cultural context in which we perform, the cultural context in which that performance is received or viewed. All of these things become incredibly important to understanding what the performance means and what it does, especially if we are not members of the culture in which that performance originates. And we'll talk about this a lot more later on in the semester when we talk about performance ethnography. Um, and that is also something we're going to talk about a little bit more when we talk about the Conquer Good article in the next lecture. So, to conclude then, uh, Suchner then wants to say that there are sort of two different ways of understanding performance studies. We can stud understand performance as the study of things that are performance, something is performance, or we can understand things as performance. So uh, to understand something that is a performance, that would be to say that there is some kind of strict standard for what it is to perform. And in Sechner's case, he wants to say that that comes from uh, the repetition of uh, historical scripts or the performance of restored behavior. But as Sechner is emphasizing, lots of things are restored behavior. All of life uh, is, involves performances of restored behavior. So when we talk then about performance uh, is something, he says. What we're usually talking about is the study of things that we can define as performance, like theater, like art, like music, and we say we want to understand or know the way those things are culturally, politically, or socially significant, and that is what we're trying to inquire about. So understanding performance <clears throat> from this first perspective, performance is, is more about treating performance as art and understanding it as art. And he wants to say that that type of performance studies, although it still exists and people definitely still want to criticize art and music to understand its influence and its meaning, um, that it's largely been displaced by the second tradition that understands uh, things as performance. That is, you can study anything virtually as a performance. We just went through that eight point list of different things that qualify as performances from technology to monuments to dance to uh, everyday sorts of interactions between you and your friends. All of those things qualify in some ways as performance um, because they all do things in a performative way. So the real question then what uh, Sechner really wants to get down to is what the per functions of performance are, is that understanding or the object of performance studies is to understand what performance does, how it works in the world, and what sorts of, as we've been saying, social, cultural, or political effects it has. So again, in Sechner's language, this is the difference between make-belief and make-belief.
which is to say with a V and then an F, which is to say that I, we oftentimes think about performances as being make-believe, as things that we have created that are fictions, um, where on the other hand, we can think about them as make-belief, that is ways of producing beliefs in the world. Um, and that second function is really how performance scholars want to understand performances, what it does, how it goes about generating beliefs. So he ends then, or we're going to end our discussion of his chapter on performance studies by emphasizing the seven functions of performance. And these functions are first to entertain and second to make something that is beautiful. So in both of these cases then, we have the typical sorts of ideas of performance as either um, an act of leisure or an act of artistic expression, something that is meant to entertain or something that is meant to be aesthetically pleasing or evocative. And this is how we would, as art critics perhaps, or literary critics, attend to performance as an aesthetic sort of object. Um, that is to say, as an art object or as an art form. But, he says, performance also has uh, five other or four other significant, eh, five other significant functions that are really important to what kind of cultural work it does. So he talks about how uh, the other functions are to mark or change identity. That is, we've talked about performing our gender identities or how we go through, for instance, the performance of a wedding ceremony to change our identity from single individuals to coupled individuals, or how a person goes through a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, for instance, to become a man or to become a woman, that these identities are things that uh, change because of traditions that we enact, that they also have social functions like making and fostering community, or functions like healing, or teaching, persuading, or convincing. Um, and all of these um, are ways in which performance plays this crucial cultural role or social role in our lives. It's also used to deal with the sacred and the demonic in many different cultural traditions, um, or to deal with the idea of sin or evil, if not explicitly the demonic. So all of the traditions that we have, all of these different registers of understanding performance that we've talked about, they all have different functions as well, but many of these functions are deeply consequential to our lives. To entertain and to make something beautiful, both of those are, on their own, things that are consequential. But performance works into the everyday details of our social relationships. It works into our spiritual lives. It works into our community relationships, our political relationships. It instructs us. It persuades us. It makes us change our point of view. It helps us commune with what we perceive to be as the sacred or what we personally think is the sacred or when helps us dispel what we personally think is evil or bad energy and things like that. There are performances for all modes of being is the idea. So the study of performance is to understand how these things function in everyday life and what consequence or what difference that makes. So we're going to spend the course of the semester talking about all of these different functions, and but primarily talking about this idea of performance is and performance as. That is, we will talk about a lot in over the course of the semester different types of performance. So we'll do a unit on poetry, for instance, and we'll do a unit on combining different texts together. Those are all modes of performance, and obviously um, all of our modes of performance here will be digitally inflected, which will be interesting. But on the other hand, what um, most perform many performance scholars are interested in is this idea that anything we do and things in our very daily lives are performances as well and have rich and important consequences. And performance studies is about understanding and dissecting um, and unpacking what those social consequences are. Um, and also, potentially, and in many circumstances saying that the social consequences of performance can also be used to imagine better worlds or to build better political alternatives to the one that we, ones that we have. So performance studies is also a deeply politically committed discipline. And that's something that is going to come out increasingly over the course of our discussions this semester, um, but is a good place to leave this because really all of this makes sense um, in terms of understanding culture and society 
society and politics more than anything else. That performance is a mode of understanding the way in which our social realities are put together, in which our cultural identities and social identities are constructed, and in which from those things emerge certain political opportunities, certain potentialities for us to have equal social relationships or for us to build and foster community, and in other circumstances the performances might have restrictive or oppressive possibilities. So we have to parse out both of those dimensions. We have to understand performance studies as something that is interested in both saying performance can be freeing, performance can be rebellious, performance can get us to new ways or places of thinking, but performance is also used in everyday life to sustain power relationships that are oppressive. So that's where we're going to stop this lecture. The next lecture which I post, which will be briefer, um, it will cover poetics, process, play, and power, um, and then that'll wrap us up for today. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you in the next lecture.